Obviously, I am not Pastor Derwin. He is a broader fellow. Um, but there's a reason why him and Vicky are not here today. I want you to join me in just letting them know how much we love and appreciate him because today they are celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. That's why they're not here and gonna be out and about over the next few weeks. Yes, 30 years. Look at that. Look at that. It's so beautiful. One of the things that I love with Pastor Derwin and Vicki and being a part of staff, I've been here at TC for 10 years now, and, and they are super intentional and in always letting us know what their first ministry is, and that's to each other. And so God's commanded that, God's modeled it, and they model it for us. And the other thing that they do that is super important is they're obedient to God and pouring into the body in an intentional ways so that it does remain Jesus' church. It does not rise and fall whether they're here or not. We're grateful for their obedience. We're grateful for their gifts and they're pouring those into our body so we can continue to worship in this way while they continue to worship where they are right now. And that is a big amen and we're super grateful. So will you join me? Let's pray together. Let's pray. God, thank you for Derwin and Vicki Gray. Thank you for their family. And we thank you for this time that they're gonna have together to celebrate your faithfulness and to celebrate one another. And I pray it's just that. God, we ask your hand of protection upon them. We pray that this is going to be a time that literally they are just drawn into you and all the more falling more in love with one another. God, I thank you that they can take this time. And we trust you for how you continue to work in your body, your church, and we trust you for what you want to do this morning through your word. I take it so humbly and seriously when I think of the opportunity that I get a chance to share what it is that you're doing right now in the life of this body, in my own life. And so God, I pray that in this place today, the one thing that will be clear is who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We got some other people to invite, you know, just to say, hey, hey, we see you, okay? We've got like literally like 10,000 plus homes tuning in from all across the country, all across the city and all across the world online. Will you welcome them? Just let's give them applause and say, hey, we do see you. We're grateful that you're with us. Also, our partnerships and our correctional institutes across North Carolina and South Carolina, let them know, let them know. So today we continue in our series, Omar mentioned it, the mystery, discovering who God has called us to be. Now we're a few weeks in, if you haven't been here yet and this is your first week, that's okay. I like to say things slow sometimes just so it kind of sits in a little bit because maybe if you've heard it multiple times, it just kind of, oh yeah, yeah, we're doing that, okay, good. Well, discovering who God has called us to be. Real quick, we have an infinite God. He's not withholding anything from us. The reality is, though, he is just continues to reveal himself because if he came and was like, boom, we'd just be flat out just doing nothing, just laying on the floor, Lord Jesus, right? But no, he wants to just continue to reveal himself to us. And so this morning, what he wants to make sure we understand is who the bride of Christ is. Who is the bride of Christ? That makes me immediately think of my own bride. I wanna show you a quick picture. This is the first picture that Mary and I ever took together. Check it out. Where's it at? There it is. Hey, children right there. So that night, this is kind of cool. That night, she had thrown the first pitch out at a minor league baseball game. That's a whole thing. Like, I was like, yes, I need to know this lady. Um, and uh, I was actually away on a work trip, but we were just grabbing ice cream at a local place called the Big Dipper in my hometown, just down the street. And, um, and so, yeah, our first picture we ever took together. And so that was, that was 2010, and it was beautiful because God just invited us in to really just get to know and appreciate one another. The first time I ever sat and had coffee with her, we, were, we had a whole other plan and intention for the time that we were gonna have together. And we just started talking and I'm just like, okay, all right, I'm listening. And, and we, it was amazing how God just allowed us just to share with genuineness what he was doing in our lives and the journey that we had been on. And so he took us fast forward 
I'm thinking, this is amazing. We are enjoying this so much. And God, you know, sometimes God brings a holy discontent and when he's leading into something else and something new and something different. And so Mary was feeling led to, to be pursuing some different things in her career. And the Lord opened a door in Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, I, we were in Maryland at the time. That's 500 plus miles away. I'm like, I am gonna need to lock this down. <laughs> All right, 500 miles a long way, what are we gonna do? I was like, okay, how do I tell her I need her? To meet me at the altar. And you know, like that's what I needed her to know, right? That's what I needed her to know. And so we had this opportunity well over a year to be living life, serving in our community together, getting to know one another. And so I was loading up a moving truck and we were gonna meet her parents in Columbia, South Carolina at this new house. And we get there and I'm thinking, I, I got a ring, it's in the bag, okay? This is gonna happen, I'm gonna do this. But we're moving, there's all kinds of things happening throughout the entire weekend. And so I'm literally in the shower because I'm like, I'm getting on a plane in less than like two hours. How am I gonna ask her this? And so... Finally, God just like, he meets you in amazing ways. Clean up, get dressed, walk out, and I'm standing there. And, and she's thinking, you know, okay, well, you're gonna hug and say goodbye. And I turn and I drop down on one knee and the Lord just flooded me right there in the kitchen with just how I wanted her to know. I want her and her alone to be the recipient of my love. That's right. He's good like that. There it is. Legit, you can see we're moving in. There's all kinds of boxes in the back. Her mom actually was like, oh my gosh. And she's like, phone, she found the phone and she took that picture. Of course, Mary said yes. We've been married 10 years now this year, which is amazing. So grateful. <clears throat> I started right there because while I feel like I do an okay job at loving her, right? Because she's amazing. Jesus wants today for us to know who we are and he's gone to some great measures for us to really realize that. Not just understand it here, but to be embraced and captivated by who he is. So here's where we're gonna go today. The bride of Christ is a recipient of his sacrificial and self-giving love. The bride of Christ is a recipient of his sacrificial and self-giving love. Ephesians chapter five, verse 25 it says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What did that sacrificial love look like? He didn't just put a ring on it. Jesus, we're looking at Philippians chapter two now. Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Servant, humble, obedient. God made marriage to be something that reflects Jesus' relationship with the church. Jesus himself came as the model groom, husband to serve as bride. So, before we get any further, let's just be clear so we're all moving into this conversation together. Jesus made way so that you and I who trust in him would be his very bride. We are invited into his family through his sacrificial act on the cross and his life resurrection, all right? So we're gonna keep going in this. God meets us in a lot of ways to help really reveal that love to us. And I love how he does that so personally. Those of you that are teenager, teenagers in the room right now, when I was about 13 years old, my parents made a decision to go to um, a different church. And when we went there, um, it was amazing. He actually brought people that were my age. There were people that were a little bit older than me and they were living on mission where they were. It was like this example to me. It was, it was this surrounding me that opened my eyes and opened my heart to like a little bit different of what mission looked like. I grew up in church. I loved Jesus. I, I knew I was forgiven of my sin and that I wanted to follow him. But him surrounding me that way showed me at a very young age. So hear me. I know you hear us say this a lot if you've been a part of TC, but if this is your first time here this morning, teenagers, you are not just the church of tomorrow. You're the church now. God wants to meet, yeah, 
He has placed you where he's placed you, in your classroom, in your family, in your neighborhood, on the team that you are on. And he wants so much for you to know that you too are a part. You are the bride of Christ as well. And there are people who need that encouragement and need that hope and need to realize that truth. I am so grateful that in my story, the Lord met me in that way and invited me at an early age to see that I could be a part of what God was doing in somebody else's life. So I hope you hear that today, young person, and all of us, all of us. He surrounded me and he invited me into his mission. I wish I could say every part of my story was as fun to tell. But God did a work to move me beyond my behaviors, my actions, my story, to invite me into his story, his story. Pastor Derwin shares this all the time, and I'm so appreciative of it. If we don't understand God's story, we try to squeeze him into ours. We think ours is the whole story. No, he's inviting us into a grander one. The bride of Christ is holy, beautiful, and blameless. The bride of Christ is holy, beautiful, and blameless. I don't know about you, but there are days that I don't necessarily identify with those things if I just sit in my own self. Ephesians 5, 25 again to 27 now. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. Not all of my story looks like that. I'm sure there are parts of your story that don't look like that. For me, a young adult, many years ago, before any picture or anything that I've talked about today, I went through a divorce. And as a follower of Jesus, that's not how that's supposed to go. You just li listen to the words there. I felt unworthy of his calling. I felt broken. I was devastated. I was like, where do I go from here? What does this look like? But Jesus, but Jesus. And I don't say, yeah, you can clap for that because it, yeah. I came into a space where I was missing the mark my story missed the mark. My story missed the standard. And when I say, but Jesus, he doesn't take it lightly. God has a way about him that is intentional. Why is that? It's not about a rule. It is because he doesn't wanna see brokenness and devastation. It's because he wants us to experience the fullness of him and who he is. And he wants the world to see it like that, see him like that. But what do you do when the story doesn't add up that way? You lean on what he did at the cross. That's the only way. God did not just redeem a portion of my story as I share with you today. He started to rid me of self-righteousness and pride. He healed broken spaces where I was standing on my own good way of doing. I couldn't any longer look and say, look at me, look what I did. Man, but I could. I could point to the one who could actually do something about situations that people were walking in because I saw him meet me in mine and deliver and heal. That story, it didn't get restored the way that I would picture that. But God allowed me and freed me to continue to move forward in life in his grace and his goodness. I want you to read this verse aloud with me, if you will. Ephesians chapter one, verse four. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. Christ makes us holy and blameless. Us. Titus chapter three, verse five says, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration. Regeneration might sound like a big word. It simply means new life. If you've been a Christian for a while or not, maybe just been in the South, someone's looked at you and like, are you born again? 
Have you been regenerated? They don't say you've been regenerated. Are you born again, right? That's what that means. That's where we're going with that, all right? Renewal by the Holy Spirit. So as I was looking and preparing for this message, I came across something I thought was really cool. In Jewish culture, there was a traditional purification bath that the woman would take before the wedding celebration and the union of their marriage. Now, we heard last week that the body of Christ um, or family of God is marked by baptism, a physical act symbolic of the cleansing of a former life and rising into a new union life with Christ as his body. So let's just, let's just level it right now real quick. Take hold of this, Christ's life, his death, his resurrection makes way for the bride's purification. The bride of Christ is holy, beautiful, and blameless because he's holy, beautiful, and blameless. Receive that this morning, this afternoon, coming up on it, right? <clears throat> also, the bride of Christ obeys Jesus in response to his love obeys Jesus in response to his love. My understanding really growing up for a long time was that um, obedience was a choice that I willed myself to make. And there is a reality that there's choices to be made all the time. Sometimes the feelings don't match them, right? But as God's continued to work in my life and reveal more of himself to me, I see obedience as a response. It's less about a rule and so much more about his way being formed in me. As I shared a few minutes ago, God does have a way about him. He's serious about it. But he shows himself and not just saying, here's what the rule is, now go and do. He models it. He models it through his love and through his grace and through his compassion. I don't know about you guys if you have kids or not, um, but... Sometimes, you know, you got to have some bargaining chips on the table if you want them to follow the rule, right? I'm not ashamed to say this. We have given our son cash to eat vegetables, all right? <laughs> Just, if you follow our social media, he's on there. Like, literally, he came up with his own song, and he, was, he had a dance and everything. It was amazing. He's like, yep, I'm eating my vegetables. Cash money. Cash money. It's there. It's really there. He also gave me this today, and he said, hey, Dad, take that up there so you can show your friends. I was like, okay, we got it. Yeah, right? He made that yesterday. I think it was yesterday, yeah. <laughs> In another situation, though, two weeks ago, um, almost two weeks ago, it was the middle of last week, um, two really good friends of my wife, lifelong friends, um, they were both in our wedding, um, they, they were going through some things in life or, that are just the types of things that nobody wants to go through. Um, one of them lost her mom suddenly and unexpectedly. And less than 36 hours later, we found out that our other friend had breast cancer. And my wife was noticeably, um, she was sad, you know, she was crying and we were talking a little bit. And so she goes into the other room and Jax is like, is mommy okay? And I was like, she's kind of sad right now. And so he just marches himself right on over and into the bedroom. And he asks, he's like, mommy, are you okay? And so Mary did a good job of just trying to explain what was going on. And his response was like instantaneous and without question. Well, I'm gonna go get my markers and I'm gonna get my paper and I'm gonna draw you a heart so you aren't sad anymore. And then we're gonna pray for your friends. Mm. Was, yeah, it did, we, yeah. I wasn't crying until then, right? I was like, okay. But it was beautiful and here's the thing. As much as we try to teach him what love looks like and caring looks like, you know, try to tell him this is what you do in certain situations, he was responding to having seen someone who showed him what love and caring looks like. It's a beautiful picture of how God reaches us and makes himself known to us. And it produces something in us that is an overflow. I've seen a lot of people follow rules, me being one of them, and you can get really, really tired and really, really cranky. But when you realize how loved you are, it's less about making a decision to follow a rule and be like, I'm obedient. No, you find yourself in obedience as you're walking in spaces that you never would have written for yourself. And you see him there and other people get to see him there. That's what that gets to look like. <clears throat> 
Let me get on the right page and then we'll do this. All right, you still with me? Are you sure? Okay, all right, good, good. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter five, verse 28 through 33. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Can you, can you hear the great commandment in there at all? Love others as you love yourself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. To sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So if we got started today and you started hearing me read the verses and you're thinking that today is about marriage, I'm going to still talk to you a little bit more about Mary and I's marriage here in a second. But here's what we want to land. Christ modeled something for us that doesn't just serve husbands and wives and how you treat each other. It serves every person in every relationship and every space that he's given you opportunity. I hit it just a few minutes ago. A servant who's humble and obedient. That's going to bring things into your marriage, that's gonna bring things into your family and into your relationships and friendships that are eternal and everlasting. <clears throat> Can you see the union work happening in this verse? I was really thinking about it, and it might be simple for some of you, but some, sometimes things takes a little bit of time to, to really settle in into my heart and mind, but I really, really, really was appreciative as I looked at this. I was like, literally, Christ came in the way that he did and he invited us in himself. He provided the purification that led us into a union with him, and we are now one body. When you talk about the husband, that whole part where it's like the husband leaves his father and mother and goes and joins his wife, Jesus left heaven to prepare a way for us to join him, and there is a unity, an intimate unity that he forms so that then our union as one body shows the world who he is. So, saw a picture of Mary and I from 2010. We got engaged in 2011. And we navigated a lot through that. You heard some of my story, the baggage that came with it and walking through it, but we were pressing on and we saw this space that we wanted to go to. In July of 2012, we were set to get married in Block Island, Rhode Island. Now, Mary um, had grown up in the Northeast, and so her family would go there and visit in the summers. It was a beautiful place. I had never been there. I was like, you've never steered me wrong. I'm trusting this is gonna be amazing, I promise you. I was on the ferry, and we were going in. I was like, we're in a movie. This is nice. You know, it was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. But Friday, <sighs> Friday storms rolled in, okay, and, and literally clouds everywhere, we still had people who were gonna be in the wedding party that were supposed to be coming over on the ferry. They were getting sick because it was not a fun ride. We're like, come to our wedding, let's celebrate together. You know, like there's just, they're like, thanks a lot, thanks. You know, but they're, they're coming over, they're, they're, that's all going on. One of our friends even missed the ferry, so she had to like rent a puddle jumper. She, she got into a small, tiny plane and they flew over to the island and she, she got there, she got there. The rehearsal dinner was supposed to be outside overlooking the water. We were inside some wooden building and, and that's where we had rehearsal dinner. Things were not coming together the way we had pictured it. My wife, she was pretty strong. She was planning this alongside her mom and everything, but there came a point that the tears came. What in the world is going on? <laughs> Why is this happening like this, right? So when she went to bed that night, she was in the room with her parents and her niece actually went in there and cuddled up with her. It was clouds and rain. Not really sure what the next day was gonna look like. But the Lord woke her in the morning. Everybody else stayed asleep, but she could see a glimmer of light coming through the window. And so she went upstairs to the other room where the bridal party would be getting ready. And when she stepped into that space and she looked out that window, this is what she saw. Yeah, beautiful, right? And it, the light just continued to spread across the water and extinguish the shadows from the day before. 
And she's sitting there taking that in in that moment. And the verse that came to mind right away is your mercies are new every morning. You are faithful. Great is your faithfulness. And she saw the, the waves coming and going. And it was just this reminder of his relentless grace that just continues to come and meet us. Cool thing too, as a part of this, my dad was outside that same one. He's an early riser. And so I'm sure it was dark when he first got there, but he was on the edge of the water and he said he saw the sun rising. He said, as it got up to a certain point, literally the light from the sun tracked the water all the way to his feet. And he was like, I'm lighting your path. I'm leading them in a new union and a new day, walk in it. God reaches us and meets us in so many different ways. Today, as I share this story with you, I'm not sharing a story with you to be like, look for the sign, okay? He will reveal himself to you the way that he wants to reveal himself to you. What I want you to know today is, today might feel like Friday for you, but there is going to be a wedding day. Revelation chapter 19, write it down. I'm not gonna preach on that right now, okay? But Revelation chapter 19, it, the, the subtext says there, it's the marriage supper of the lamb. It is this point where there's no, worse, no more sin, no more division, no more weight, no more tears, no more sickness or illness. But Jesus gets the fulfillment of what the father told him. When the lamb comes forward and his bride is presented in her perfection, holy, beautiful, and blameless. And all of heaven echoes what it has for eternity. Only us has a new home. And we're singing a song that's declaring who he is. That's gonna come. And you're saying, oh, that sounds great, Pastor Curtis, but what about now? It feels like Friday. I've got things in my life that I don't, I don't know how he forgives. I don't know how I can forget it. I don't know what it looks like to move forward. I even think about the fact of like the church itself. These last several years have given us a picture to where Christians a lot of times do not reflect. But listen to me, Jesus did not do what he did on the cross just to be words on a page. He had an intention and a purpose that is gonna be fulfilled in you and I, you and I, and not just us. Stand up with me if you will and look around. Look around, every tribe, language, and people and nation. When you stand right now, we stand in unison, in unity because of who he is. And if maybe you're not a follower of Jesus yet, we're gonna get to that in a minute, that's okay. I want you to embrace the fact and the reality that he loves you with an everlasting love that is perfect.